Greetings, campers. Welcome to the big, wide, wonderful world, according to Yoni. Uh, as I have been for the last year on this broadcast, I am your host, Yoni Martin, which means you're still not me. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, since last week's show with uh, my guest Jody Hamilton was our first anniversary show, I guess that makes this show the... Uh, for a show of our second season. So yay us, we've made it. Um, I think uh, we've decided over the last couple weeks, month, to start mixing things up on the show a bit. Um, as the show started out, we were very, very, very political, as how could you not be? Uh, even when we guessed, we had guests like uh, comics like the Frangela duo and uh, Tony Award winning actors like Michael Cerverus, we still talked a good deal of politics. And my guest today is a very political guy, but I was so anxious to talk to him about the theater and film and television that uh, politics kind of went out the window. Uh, we also talked for two hours. So I decided what I'm going to do is break this interview up into two sections. We're going to do one part this week, one part next week. And in the meantime, when I have things to say of a political nature, I'm going to go onto YouTube and do a live broadcast. Uh, they'll still remain after I'm finished, but... I'm going to do them live so that uh, I can say what I mean and what I have to say, and you can be there or not as you choose and watch it later. Now, all of this leads me uh, to my guest today, and I can't. When I first started the show, I had a list of people a mile long who uh, I wanted to get on as guests. Um, I had musicians, actors, uh, comics, all, all these wonderful, wonderful people, a number of whom have actually already been on the show. But the person who topped my list was a man many of you may not know by name. The name is Louis J. Stadlin. Now, for my money, Louis Stadlin is maybe one of the best actors of his generation. Lewis never seemed to have an interest in being a star, you know, quote unquote, whatever that means. Uh, he wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be a really, really fine actor. Well, uh, believe me, uh, there are very few who are as fine as him. And of course, Lewis has worked, he's done Broadway shows, he's done regional shows, he's done national tours. Um, he's worked with his friends, Nathan Lane and director Jerry Zachs, more times than I can count. He was Nathan Detroit in the first national company of Guys and Dolls. He, uh, he played Max Bialystok in The Road Company and on Broadway in the musical version of The Producers. I first came upon Lewis in 1974. I don't know whether uh, I was on break from college for you know spring or summer, but as I always did when I came home from college, I went to see everything I could on Broadway. And I just happened into the, broad, the, uh, the Broadway theater where the show Candide was going on. For those of you listening and not watching, I am holding up the playbill, which I still have, to Candide. Uh, Lewis was 27 years old when he starred in Candide. He played, I don't know, five, six roles in it. Uh, Voltaire, Dr. Pangloss, uh, govern, uh, Governor, totally different roles. And he was staggeringly brilliant. Um, when I walked out of that theater that first time, I was in awe. I said to myself, this is the kind of actor I want to be. Um, 
Lewis should have won the Tony Award that year for Best Actor in a Musical. He lost to the late Christopher Plummer, and no disrespect to uh, Mr. Plummer, who was a brilliant actor. Lewis deserved the Tony that year and should have gotten it, but hey, that's the way things work out. Uh, Lewis also has written an autobiography. Now, it came out in, I don't know, 2008, 2009. It's called Acting Foolish. This is one of the best theatrical autobiographies I've ever read. And on my shelves back here, I have enough theatrical biographies and autobiographies to sink a battleship. So when I, when I tell you Lewis's book is wonderful, uh, I, I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Lewis is also working on his second book now, which is not a bad thing to do during a pandemic when you can't act. Um, but I want Lewis to speak for himself uh, because Lewis is one of those people who will say what's on his mind. He says what he thinks for good or bad. And in the acting world, that can get you in a lot of trouble. But uh, Lewis, I don't, think, I don't think he ever really cared about becoming a star. What he wanted to be was a terrific, maybe even great actor. And as far as I'm concerned, he has succeeded and then some. I think uh, his friend Nathan Lane said once, uh, he said, you run away from trying to be a star. And I, th I think it's possibly true. But it doesn't matter because he's one of the most respected actors uh, on the Broadway stage, on the regional stage. Uh, and he has created some of the most incredibly memorable roles. I can't count the number of times I've seen him, but trust me on this, Lewis is an amazing talent. That being said, I promised him I was going to be a good boy and I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to spend the whole show being a fanboy. I'm going to fail at this, but I'm going to give it a try. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to give to you uh, certainly one of my favorite actors of all time, Mr. Lewis J. Stadlin. Let's, let's just... Get moving, and I'll just say, Louis Stadlin, welcome. Um, I am honored that that you're here. Uh, I I know I've been so effusive in everything I've said to you over the phone and in email, but uh, you're my David Burns. How's that? That sounds great. You know, I'm not particularly good at receiving all this affirmation, but uh, yeah, thank you. He was, he was really um, somebody that I basically channeled uh, for the last 55 years. Yeah, and I've been channeling you since 1974. So it's been, we're, we're becoming all the cockers now. I don't know what, uh, what we do with that. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what an Alta Cocker is, it means we're getting a little older. Um, let's start the fact that you come from a showbiz family. Your dad, Alan Swift. Do um, you know, my first memory of your father is the last day he was Captain Alan Swift. I remember him tossing his bag over his shoulders he made his way off the ship and the next day or whatever it was captain jack mccarthy showed up really yeah that's nice i was five years old and i remember that clearly and then uh of course i was a big fan of diver dan so we switched from wpix to wnew new york uh it was diver dan and felix the cat as i remember and Uncle, it was Uncle Fred Scott, right? Who was doing the hosting, but your dad did the voice of Diver Dan and most of the puppets in that show. So I, I kind of grew up with your dad to some degree. Not Mighty Mouse. He was the voice of Mighty Mouse. 
He he did a lot. Yeah, he did a lot of voiceover work, didn't he? He was Oni Coloni, the skunk who talked like Ronald Coleman. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, so you come by it naturally. Um, I, 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 I held this up before, but I think holding up your autobiography, Acting Foolish, uh, to give it a plug because uh, I, as I read, somebody was uh, writing about you and saying that your autobiography did not get the play it deserved. And I tend to agree with that. I love theatrical biographies and autobiographies and yours is probably one of the most honest um, I've ever read. You, you have a tendency to say what you think. And uh, I don't, I, I don't know, you know, that, gets people in trouble. Uh, so I, I have the utmost respect for you uh, in doing that. Um, you started out with Sandy Meisner and that wasn't a real great experience for you, was it? No, but uh, no, it was, uh, it was uh, terrible. And he was a real bastard. Uh, but what, came out of that that was constructive was I had been telling everybody that I didn't want to go to college because I was going to be an actor. And so at 17, I, me and my friend Cliff Lipson, we were the youngest uh, members of the uh, neighborhood playhouse in which Sandy Meisner was the resident guru acting coach. Right. And uh, both of us were not invited back to the second year, which brought about a, you know, instead of just lying down and saying, oh, my God, I've been rejected and that's the end of my uh, 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 embryonic acting career, I experienced narcissistic rage and moved on. And I think that that's what actors need to do. They have to realize that if they have a really good career, they're going to be rejected 90% of the time. I think I may have reached 95%. So we're doing real well here. But in, in, in leaving the neighborhood playhouse, you found Stella Adler. And I mean, again, in my love of theatrical bios, the Adler family going back to Jacob and coming over from Russia and doing the Yiddish theater in New York. What a family. Uh, and Stella, quite the character. Well, she saved my life. Uh, there's really two forms of acting that's taught in the United States. And one is this obsession with capturing the real moment. Stella Adler's concept of acting was that you had to uh, use your brain to figure out what the play is about, how your character fits into the uh, puzzle of the play. Who do you represent? And um, uh, she was, uh, her, her, her teaching was uh, that if you're going to play Hamlet, you can't begin by saying Hamlet's a guy like me. You have to say that uh, Hamlet is uh, pretty far from you, unless you happen to be. Happen to be a king of Denmark? <laughs> yeah, the prince of Denmark. Um, and she taught that you have to figure out what side of the political equation you your character is on and that really interested me because politics is something that um uh i've been obsessed with ever since my grandfather sat me down on his knee when i was six years old and said lewis the worst democrat is better than the best republican <laughs> <laughs> my parents were the same they met at a meeting of the new deal democrats in new york city in 1947 so uh, I, I, we had that in common. And but let me tell you, I, I just want to ex uh, 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 expand on what Stella uh, taught, which was very different than improvising. And she basically said that if you know what you're doing, uh, you will be able to simulate reality. And anybody who has done eight performances a week or four performances a week realize that you are not always at peak concentration. Sometimes you're up there and 
you're thinking, what am I going to have to eat between shows, you know, or I'm just simply exhausted and I have to get through the week. And what you do is you, you set a blueprint in rehearsal and you never allow your performance to fall below a certain level because your responsibility is not only to the playwright, but it's also to the people who are paying money to see you perform. Can't argue that one. Uh, yeah, I, I had similar. I started out at the Strasburg Institute with Lee and uh, had a similar experience like you did with Sandy Meisner and was fortunate enough to afterwards find a teacher who taught me very much like it sounds Stella taught you. Yeah, it's a credit to you. You survived Lee Strasberg, and I survived uh, 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 Sanford Meisner. The yeah. other thing I wanted to tell you just about the technique that Stella, I uh, the first time I ever did a scene for her in her scene study class, I was 18 years old. I didn't know anything. And uh, I decided that I was going to do the last monologue from um, uh, uh, Glass Menagerie which I was preposterously wrong for at 18 as I would be now. And it was a bad decision anyway, because it's a beautiful poetic monologue, blow out your candles, Laura, and you really should have the experience of the entire play before you, you know, uh, perform the monologue. At any rate, she said to me, uh, are you uh, Jewish? I said, yes. She said, are you from Brooklyn? I said, no, I'm from Queens, actually. She said, you're nice. You're a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn. But that's not good enough. And she said, you are playing Tennessee Williams himself, who was a poet. And so you have to understand that you are representing the sensibility of all the poets in the, in the world. And then she explained that there are people who have a, an artistic poetic sensibility and there are those who have a material sensibility and that's the great majority of people and those are the people who should not be in show business <laughs> and she gave this as an example you know you take a, a, a glass and somebody who has a material sensibility would say oh i i recognize this glass i i i paid five dollars for this glass and then i got two more for twelve dollars while somebody who has a poetic abstract sensibility would say this is somewhat of a miracle i mean how did they shape it like this i mean this is like a piece of sculpture you know so once she said that to me all of a sudden it wasn't just about the mumbo jumbo of whether you your improvisation was real enough but it was about this is a craft element that i of course put forth in everything that I do for the rest of my uh, professional life. And it's been one hell of a professional life. Um, I, I, as you know, as I've told you, I have followed you since Candide. Somehow I missed out on Minnie's Boys. I don't know how that happened because <laughs> I am- You weren't the only one. It, it, it didn't run very long. It, well, that's probably why, because I, I, I was a Marx Brothers fan and still am a Marx Brothers fanatic. And so to have missed that, and I, I had heard, you know, it was having problems and all sorts of things. But then after it closed, I heard there was this guy who played Groucho Marx who was amazing. And I was like, well, fuck, damn, I didn't want to miss that. Uh, and then in 1974, this opened. <laughs> and I watched you three times. I was uh, I sat in the uh, in those on the stools in the center section and in the bleachers around, so I could see everything. The orchestra in its different spots. Paul Gemignani doing his thing, and how you in your twenties pulled off Voltaire, Dr. Pangloss. Well, I mean, it was an amazing, amazing piece of work. Um, I'd be intimidated to do it now. And 
you you really uh i came out of the theater the first time i saw it and i was i was in awe i i really was thank you well you're young and when you're <laughs> young you can you you accept every challenge you know they harold prince said he it was not only Pangloss and Voltaire, I also had to play the governor of Buenos Aires. And, and uh, that was sung originally in the uh, Tyrone Guthrie production by an opera singer. And so the songs, now two songs that were of an operatic caliber. And um, he said, do it. And I did it. Now, I never could do that. I would never be foolish enough to do that again. But <laughs> in your 20s, you know, you figure, sure, why not? I've got a good question I've, because I've been hearing about this for years and I want to know if it's true. Somebody somewhere along the line told me that they wanted you to do Dr. Pangloss as Groucho. And you said, I, I've done Groucho. I don't want to do Groucho again. And you chose to do Professor Irwin Corey instead. No, no. you're talking about Pangloss? Yeah. Oh, Pangloss, I see. Uh, the major challenge was to do Voltaire. And uh, uh, first of all, in terms of Groucho Marx, uh, as much as that was a wonderful experience and I became good friends with Groucho and, you know, I idolized Groucho, uh, it was a double-edged sword because I realized that I could be typed as uh, a Groucho Marx uh, imitator. Yep. Uh, as a matter of fact, the New York Times review said, yeah, he's great at doing this. It was Clive Bonds, but maybe they just found this kid, you know, from under a rock and that's all he did. So I did everything possible to distance myself from Groucho Marx. I was super sensitive about ever replicating that performance. When we did Candide, and I was just trying out a lot of different voices, and the first person that came to me was Hal Holbrook's uh, Mark Twain. And I think the only direction that Hal Prince ever gave me was, no, it's too guttural. And I realized I had to do it on a higher pitch, that he was, you know, a more pristine, aristocratic voice. Um, so that was the major challenge. In terms of Voltaire, I don't know what I did vocally, but it was basically because he believed that everything was for the best in this best possible, best of all possible worlds. He he was uh, blind to reality. So what I remember doing was I made him very nearsighted, like he couldn't see anything. <laughs> and whatever came along vocally, you know, that's the interesting thing about acting. It's it's like even playing Groucho. When I first got the job. I thought, oh, how did I do it in the audition? How do I replicate Groucho Marx? Because I was very sensitive because if I was sitting in the audience, I would have been the most critical person of a young actor imitating Groucho Marx. I didn't want it to be, you know, this, these awful imitations, you know, and there's a guy, because Groucho was so, so subtle when he performed that it all came across as if he was improvising the dialogue, which he was not. Um, so I realized at a certain point, it's not about the voice. It's not about the way he walks. But what it is about is his concept of life is that he can take the most neutral statement and turn it skeptical. And when that happens, you know, all of a sudden, you're like looking up to heaven like, why is life so inequitable? And when that happens, you know, your wrists break and your knees break and you don't, you don't walk standing up straight. You walk with a slant to the back. And that you can – I was always very good. Even when I didn't have chops as an actor, the thing that I was always good at was physicalizing a character that I had to play. I understand completely. Uh, uh, speak, uh, I'm reminded before we got to Minnie's Boys and Candide 
there was Fiddler on the Roof. Now, I know that I've been told there are two shows that always tour. And if you can get into a company of one of them, you can work forever because they are always touring. Fiddler on the Roof and Hello, Dolly. And you've done both. Well, Fiddler on the Roof, I mean, that was that was my entrance into the fraternity of being a professional actor. Um, and it's a masterwork. Uh, uh, I joined the uh, first national company of Fiddler on the Roof, which was the second professional company ever. And Luther Adler was the Tevye. Yeah. And I didn't think that he was particularly good. He was a wonderful actor, but he played it like he was a Talmudic scholar, and that's not who Tevye is. Tevye is a, a milkman, a dairyman, who longs to, you know, uh, sit with people, with learned men at the Eastern Wall. Um, but I was uh, met at the gates of professional theater by Fivish Finkel, who became a surrogate father and uh, was so generous and so f filled with theatrical history. And it wasn't just Fivish. Fivish belonged to a, <laughs> a dressing room. When I joined the company in Chicago at the uh, Mick Vickers Theater, which is long gone now that it's a bank, uh, there was a room that was filled up with Fivish Finkel, Borchel Lamet who was Sidney Lament's father. He played the rabbi. I played uh, the rabbi's son. Uh, Maurice Brenner, who played Avram the bookseller, and a man by the name of Clarence Hoffman, who they all couldn't stand. He played the Russian uh, constable, who keeps coming back and finally tells them they have to leave Anatevka. And he was Jewish, and he kept saying to me, do you know how terrible I feel about having to to, you know, tell you to leave Anatevka. And Fivish would say, nobody gives a shit, Clarence. You're a professional <laughs> actor. Just go out and do it. Stop trying to be sympathetic. And that's another thing, now that I'm free associating, I think one of the things about my career is that I've never pandered to the audience for love. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was playing Horace Vandegelder, an old agent of mine came back and he was complimenting me about my Vandegella performance. And I said, well, I, I kind of play him like he's bipolar. And he, said, he said to me, you play everything like the, you're bipolar. And um, what I do is I try to find the flaw in the character and then I beat on it for the whole night and dare the audience to not only find me amusing, but to identify with the idea that they're, they're looking at an extremely flawed human being. And that's what, it's imperfection that makes for good comedy in, in terms of the way I look at it. So, okay, so we were talking about, uh, I was talking about five-ish. Um, it was obvious from even the few minutes uh, I got to talk to him at your book signing that the love between the two of you was just, I mean, it, it was so obvious. And it, it was really beautiful thing to see. I mean, when you were doing, when you were doing your reading and telling your stories and he was sitting there, you the pride in his face it, it was really wonderful. And his sons. I mean, the, uh, the Finkel family have uh, the audition that I had for Minnie's Boys in which I, you know, they asked for an up-tempo and a ballad. And what I did was I uh, created kind of like a nightclub routine in which I sang It's Only a Shanty in Old Shanty Town because it's a very sentimental song. And Groucho's whole persona mocks sentimentality. And then I wrote my own uh, Groucho-isms, my own jokes, which I interspersed while I sang the song. And uh, Elliot Finkel, uh, Fivish's youngest son, was 16 at the time. Big guy. He was six foot six, even when he was 16. 
and I referred to him like he was, um, he was, he became my foil while he played the piano. And I referred to him as Emily Schmalhausen, which was, you know, <laughs> basically uh, uh, Margaret Dumont. So, and then uh, I had a, a very close relationship with Ian uh, Finkel, the world's greatest xylophone uh, player who uh, died tragically of COVID this past year. Yeah, it's 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 been a rough year for a lot of us, uh, yeah. but hopefully we're coming out of it. Um, yeah. So you did your you did fiddler um, until uh, you you left it and then you went back to it, correct? And then okay. in Philadelphia is when you heard about the audition for Minnie's Boys. Yes. So back to New York. And all those hundreds of Harpos and Chicos and Grouchos and Zeppos. And one other Groucho. I couldn't believe it. There were a hundred people in uh, um, Chubut Alley dropping silverware out of their pockets, you know, like Harpo, uh, a lot of Chicos. One other Groucho who was extremely overweight <laughs> and, and put the a, a grease mustache on in such a grotesque manner. He was doing that, you know, rah, 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 rah. it was just awful. And they gave me the job on the spot and I didn't have an agent. It was an open call. Wow. So, How often does that happen? Uh, you know, and the only reason that uh, I had that, you know, I was, uh, I could avail myself of that situation was because they couldn't hire, you know, Dustin Hoffman. There were, you know, they had to find somebody who could replicate the Marx Brothers. And then we went into rehearsal and I, I can honestly say that every mistake you could make in putting on a Broadway musical, they made. And there was such goodwill connected to the project because everybody wanted a Marx Brothers musical to succeed. But, you know, they hired the world's worst director, the world's phoniest choreographer. <laughs> It was just, uh, and Shelley Winters was an absolute catastrophe. Um, How many writers also you, I seem to recall, they kept bringing in people to rewrite. Well, David Steinberg wrote the first book. Right. And then Groucho insisted that uh, it wasn't really a musical comedy libretto because he had never written one. So it's kind of like a play in the there was no place for the songs to fit in. Then he insisted that his son, Arthur Marx, and his partner, Bob Fisher, that they would write it. And then they fired the director too late uh, uh, after the first week of uh, previews. And they brought in Stanley Prager, who was a good director, you know, nine to five. You know, it wasn't Jerome Robbins by any means, but a good professional director. And uh, Mark Bro, a, a good professional choreographer. And then he brought in his his uh, <laughs> his friends from Hollywood, and we ran in previews forever. I, I mean, we ran for eighty four performances in previews, and at a certain point, we were rehearsing a new first act that had nothing to do with the second act. So they sent me out one day. They said, "Here, since it doesn't, you know, uh, make any sense, here's a, a monologue." go out in front of the uh, the curtain. And it was a terrible monologue, you know, like, well, I see you're still with us, you know, well, uh, you know, if the orange juice in the lobby didn't get you, nothing will, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, I guess you wondering, you know, what happened to the Marx Brothers? Well, Uncle Al died and blah, blah, blah. So they handed it to me and they said, do it tonight. I said, I can't do this tonight. I can't, I gotta sleep on dialogue. I can't, they said, well, we'll put it in a variety. So I went out and I did it. Well, about a week later, I receive a fan letter from the British director, Peter Glenville, who was a terrific director. He directed uh, Beckett on Broadway, you know? Yes. And it was just a wonderfully complimentary letter saying that he, you know, it was the best performance by a young actor you've seen in many a moon. He said, but if I, if I might, you know, 
uh, give you a criticism. I didn't feel that your curtain speech at the beginning of the second act was up to the level of the rest of your performance. <laughs> your unrehearsed, uh, unmemorized uh, curtain speech. Wow. Uh, I, 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 I can only imagine... Uh, I mean, I've heard the stories. The, th the stories are theater legend, but imagine living through them. Uh, I, I can't. I can't. I'm looking. I'm sitting here looking at all the playbills I have. Sunshine Boys. Now, how cool is it that you can go from playing Ben way back, you know, in the original production and then you play Willie Clark now, or when you did. Uh, how, how does that feel? Because I haven't graduated from, like, I played Muddle and Fiddler on the Roof. I'm ready to do Tevye. I haven't done it yet. How does it feel to graduate like that? Well, I've also graduated from Mendel the Rabbi's Son and Muttle Taylor. I stood by for Muttle Taylor, and I played it about 13 times. But I was Mendel the Rabbi's Son, and I played Tevye twice at the Muni and um, at the Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera. So I did that too. But in terms of the Sunshine Boys, you're a good interviewer because you're bringing up stuff that I haven't really thought about in a long time. The Sunshine Boys was difficult for me because I had to play a variation of myself. And at that stage of the game, uh, I didn't know I had a personality or I certainly didn't think that my personality was good enough to be entertaining enough. So I had to strip away the, the different characters of Candide and well, well, actually I hadn't done Candide yet, but Groucho Marx, you know, I had to be a 25 year old agent from William Morris. So I added the, the bullshit of an agent into the equation. Uh, then uh, a number of years ago, I guess it was about six or seven years ago, they asked me if I would play Willie Clark in uh, Northport. And I said, if my friend Chip Zion is able, if he, if you'll hire him to play the Sam Levine part, uh, uh, it's a go. And um, I pretty much try to remember uh, Jack Albertson, who I thought was pretty much definitive in the part. I thought Walter Matthau was wonderful in the movie, but... Uh, you know, you're right. Albert Albertson was. I saw Albertson and Lou Jacoby. Uh, Lou Jacoby was great. Yeah, he really was. And then, oh, uh, this goes also to the interconnections of everything. Okay, the sketch nurse was played by Lee Meredith, the original Ula in the producers, and it's one thing to see her on film. But boy, when you saw her on stage, wow. <laughs> I mean, let me tell you something. I, every month, clockwork, I would crawl up the stairs of the Broadhurst Theater and beg her to sleep with me. <laughs> I mean, she was, she had the most fantastic body and she's a very sweet, sweet woman. And I have seen pictures of her, you know, I don't know, in the last 10 years, you know in which she's no lady, like I'm an old man, and she's still beautiful, just beautiful woman. Beautiful woman. Uh, all I can remember is that nurse's outfit and <laughs> her bending over, and me, I don't know, how old was I then? I was, I was just tongue hanging out. It was, it was, you know. That was I, a I wonderful experience. That, that was a wonderful experience, the Sunshine Boys. Uh, and I learned a great deal from Sam Levine, who was, I really consider one of my foremost mentors. And uh, I had gone into that experience and everybody was saying, watch out for Sam Levine. He's impossible. And I just loved Sam Levine. And Sam was one of those, but not only was he a great actor, but uh, he was absolutely incapable of dissembling in a, you know, a business which is encourages dissembling. Uh, and he taught me the difference between getting a good laugh and a bad laugh. And uh, I, I, I just, I loved him. And uh, when I was doing the Nance, uh, I don't know, that must have been about five years ago, 
uh, Frank Rich went back to visit uh, Nathan Lane. And he asked Nathan, he said, uh, Louis Stadlin, did he ever work with Sam Levine? <laughs> and uh, Nathan said, yeah, sure he did. They did the Sunshine Boys together. He said, that's interesting because uh, I think, you know, as the years went uh, by, uh, Louis Stadlin seems to have morphed into Sam Levine. And I thought, well, that's the best review I'm ever going to get from Frank Rich. You know? Did you have a little to do with him uh, at one point? So with I with with frank rich didn't he uh i don't have anything to do with him really, I thought the only thing i had to do with him was when we opened laughter on the 23rd floor neil uh simon did such a stupid thing he he was engaged in a in a public feud with frank rich he had accused the new york times of nepotism because they hired uh, alex witchell who uh was soon to become frank rich's wife and Frank Rich was retiring as the drama critic for the New York Times. This is very annoying. These things coming. It's in. okay. You're the, you're here. I don't. I, we can ding dong till the world ends. I. All right. Uh, all he had to do was postpone the opening a week, and we would have gotten David Richards. Uh, the show opened and the last two reviews Frank Rich wrote were for Angels in America, which I see you played uh, Roy Cohn. Only thing I've ever won an award for. Yep. <laughs> well, that's, that's an epic, epic challenge. Uh, and, uh, and us laughter on the 23rd floor. Well, of course it was a, you know, vitriolic review and yep. said, if anybody wants to see something that's funny, they should go see Angels in America, which, of course, is a masterwork, but is also has a, a lot of a lot of laughs in it, too. Uh, and then uh, uh, David Richards wrote in the Sunday supplement of the Sunday Times, he wrote us a very good review. So if Neil, you know, wasn't having this public gladiator thing with Frank Rich, chances are. Uh, uh, laughter on the 23rd floor would have been uh, a, a greater success than it turned out to be. All I can tell you is I was standing room for that and I kept falling under the balustrade because I was laughing so hard. I, I, I thought, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Sid Caesar's and, and of course your show of shows. So I understood what was being done but i th i thought it was brilliant i thought it was hysterically funny and i thought you were great in it i fuck has never been uttered better on a stage than you did in laughter on the 23rd floor there was some cast too i oh mean you know, jk simmons nathan lane john slattery randy graff uh, ron orbach uh, mark lynn baker uh, pretty good yeah uh, uh, Biddy Shram. That was quite a cast. And uh, it, that was the biggest disappointment, I think, biggest surprise of my career, because we got pretty much uniformly lousy notices. And um, we ran for 10 months. But and then I directed the uh, second national company. So uh, I, I that's an important play. Somebody, I, I, I saw somebody filmed it. Was it, I don't know if it was a live performance or a movie, but they did it at home. It was a home box office movie. Oh, is that what it was? Mm -hmm. But you weren't in that, were you? Well, that's a story that uh, you'll have to read about in my second book. They uh, they offered me half. They offered Marklin Baker and me half as much money as they offered all the other actors who had never done the play. <laughs> And I thought, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. And uh, I said, no, I'm sorry, I won't do it. And they offered me a considerable amount of money, but it was still half as much as Victor Garber, let's say. So I turned them down. And then I went off to Carnegie Mellon for $350 a week to do a staged reading of a not very good play. And I remember thinking, you're a pretty strange guy. It turned out <laughs> 50 grand to do, to get $350 a week. Um, 
but uh, you know, those are the, the things that you have to do to maintain your integrity and uh, extend your career because this business, as I'm sure you know, can uh, erode your soul and yes, you have can. to do it on y your own terms in order to survive. Yeah, I, I, I have tremendous respect for you for doing that. I, for myself, I'm sad because I would have loved to have seen that performance immortalized, but uh, I get it. You know, it's, it's, since we're flying all over the place here, I have looked for quite a few years now at something, it looks like there's the Nathan Lane players because people like you, Ernie Sabella, uh, J.K. Simmons, uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, Mark, Mark Lynn Baker, keep working and work together in- Lee Wilcoff too. Lee Wilcoff. Yeah. Has done a number of plays with Nathan. So, but you, but you, I mean, you guys, you guys Eight did times. schmucks together and I can, I can, I can never call it Ms. Lansky or Zelinsky. It's always schmucks to me. I've always loved that title, but yeah, I mean, the two of I, I'm going to assume the two of you are good friends. Good friends. Closer now than we ever were. As a matter of fact, we called each other every week during the uh, pandemic, every week to see how we were doing. Uh, Nathan is a, a, a great actor, and he's also the most incredibly generous actor. There's nothing better than performing with him on stage. And uh, the thing about Nathan is he, he realizes that if he uh, surrounds himself with the best talent available, it will only make him look good. And you can't say that about a lot of people no. who headline. Um, so I think that's the reason why he keeps working with the same people over and over again. And yeah. another thing about Nathan is that for somebody who has reached the, his level of stardom, he's really maybe, he may be the only real theatrical star who, who is box office, you know, who, who isn't a movie star or a TV star. Um, he's handled the, the, his life challenges uh, in a in a in a very uh, unneurotic way. I look at him as the greatest Jewish actor who grew up Catholic in Jersey City. I mean, yes, he and Mickey Rooney. Yeah, uh, ju he he amazes me in everything I've ever seen him do. Uh, but the two of you together, playing off each other, and you talk about the generosity. We're going to jump around again the generosity when you were doing banjo in the man who came to dinner i watched him watch you and he was enjoying you so much that it, you could tell you could tell that he loved watching you steal a scene and you did i mean uh, well that's all right. good acting I mean, he was supposed to be a man who was in love with Banjo. You know, they, they, uh, Banjo is supposed to be Harpo, and uh, he was supposed to be Alexander Wolcott. That's what, those are the characters that they were based on. And uh, Groucho said that uh, Wolcott loved Harpo so much that he wanted to have his child. <laughs> so, you know, Nathan is, yeah. Uh, but I, I, now, in terms of generosity, the reason why... One of the reasons why I think I gave a standout performance in that was because I was able to sing a song that is not part of the original script. It was added as a specialty number for Jimmy Durante, who played banjo in the movie. So before we went into rehearsal, uh, Nathan said, you know that number that uh, he, he sings, Durante? Why don't you learn that number? And on the first day of rehearsal, we'll try to convince Jerry Zachs to put it in. And uh, I went to Jerry, who I've done seven plays with. Right. 
And I said, you know that number, uh, did you ever get the feeling that you wanted to stay? Uh, I said, do you think we could, uh, you know, maybe put that in? He went, oh, I don't know, you know, because <laughs> I don't like it. You know, uh, I, I'll cut it and then you'll be upset. And uh, I said, okay, fine. Well, banjo doesn't come in until the third act. So Jerry, who loves uh, immediate gratification <laughs> wasn't terribly pleased with uh, the first uh, table reading and so before we started the third act he said yeah why don't you just try it and i tried it and of course from that point on it was in Polly Atlas! Woo! come back here you red-headed vixen get away from me get away from me you... <laughs> i love you man Afraid of my passion? Kiss me! I can feel the hot blood pounding through your varicose veins. Banjo, Banjo, for God's sake! Hello, Whiteside. Will you sign for this package, please? <laughs> Banjo, that is my nurse, you mental delinquent. Come to my room in a half an hour and bring some rye bread. <laughs> Spend Christmas with you. Give me a kiss. Oh, get away from me, you <coughs> reform school fugitive. How did you get here, anyway? Carl Santa cloned me as reindeer. <laughs> what? I, we finished shooting a picture yesterday, and I'm on my way to Nova Scotia. Flew here in 12 hours. Borrowed an airplane from Howard Hughes. Whiteside, I brought you a wonderful Christmas present. This brassiere was once worn by Hedy Lamar. <laughs> How long can you stay? I may stay a month, or I may leave immediately. I don't know. Things are so uncertain. Did you ever get the feeling that you wanted to go, but you still had the feeling that you wanted to stay? You knew it was right. Wasn't wrong. Still, you knew it wouldn't be very long. It's tough to have the feeling that you wanted to go. Still have the feeling that you wanted to stay. Started to go. Change your mind. Start to go again. But change your mind again. Did you ever have the feeling that you Just long enough to take a bath. I'm on my way to Nova Scotia. Where's Maggie? Nova Scotia? What are you going to Nova Scotia for? I'm sick of Hollywood. And there's a dame in New York I don't want to see. <laughs> Whose idea was it to go do the whole thing backwards? after? Jerry. That was Jerry's idea. That, that was sheer brilliance. I mean, I, 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 I was in awe. I, I, I was absolutely in awe because I've always wanted to play banjo. And, you know, if I ever get that chance, I have to steal you. And thank God I've got it on video so I, I, I can. Cause well, that's all right. I mean, that's all, all good actors steal. I, I, you know, when I did Tevye, I was doing it uh, at the Muni and you only have 10 days rehearsal. You know, Muni is this big 11,000 seat theater in St. Louis, outdoor theater. And um, as uh, I was walking to rehearsal, the stage manager, who was a very nice guy, he said to me, you know what I really am loving about your performance? That you're not imitating Zero Mostel. And I said, well, that's interesting because I am attempting to remember every single line reading that Zero Mostel gave because no one will ever be better than Zero Mostel in that part. And there are two things that I've noticed in show business. They always say, whoever does Tevye, they say is better than Zero Mostel. And whoever does Mama Rose and Gypsy, they all say is better than Ethel Merman. And no one is better than Ethel Merman. And no one is better than Zero Mostel. <laughs> well, I mean, how could anybody be better than Zero Mostel? I, I've seen, 
I saw Herschel Bernardi, and I was really disappointed by Herschel Bernardi. I, I thought that was like, it, it was, it, if I were a rich man, it was like, yeah, okay, nice. I mean, if you w- w- even watch the Tony Awards where they came back to do numbers from the old shows, and he did, if I, Zero did, if I were a rich man. I mean, it, well, Zero was a force of nature, and he was an antic comedian and uh, <clears throat> and, a, and a dramatic uh, actor as well. He could combine those. Herschel Bernardi, uh, he, he wasn't particularly funny. You know, he was a good, solid actor, and, uh, you know, he was fine. But uh, but Zero was a genius. <laughs> yeah. That's the difference. <laughs> I, 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 when I did the show, our, our, <laughs> our Tevye, who was not Jewish, uh, tried to imitate um, uh, Topol's performance. Oh, and I was like, it was like, okay, a non-Jew with uh, no Yiddish akup imitating Topol. Who had no Yiddish akup. Yeah. It was like an Israeli paratrooper. He was exactly. awful. And a, a real prick, too. Everybody hates Topol. Really? Oh, yeah. Nobody can stand him. See, yeah. there's the thing, Lewis. You'll say that a lot of people won't won't say that. Um, but yeah, it it was watching Zero Mostel do anything. Uh, I, I I think of every movie. I mean, okay, now now I'm going to jump again because I'm thinking. I remember when you did to be or not to be with uh, Mel Brooks. You had problems, to say the least. To say the least. To say the least. But what was funny about in reading your problems, what I was thinking was, when I was reading about the making of the producers, Zero was giving Mel the same crap that Mel was giving you. So it was... <laughs> You know, I'm I'm sitting there going, okay. Do you reach a certain stage where you now feel you can do that to the the pitcher who comes along? I I don't know. Well, but- Zero gave everybody problems. Uh, you know, Zero he would get uh, bored early, and and Zero was this wild improvisational spirit, and much of the of the dialogue in Fiddler on the Roof was invented by, by Zero. Um, and Mel, who is brilliant, he's a comic genius. Yeah. Uh, when things are going well, uh, you, it's fun to be around him. And when he's nervous about things and he's afraid that it's going to fail, uh, he's horrible. And, um, he was very worried about um, To Be or Not To Be because it was a remake of a, a pretty much a yeah, master. any movie. Yeah, uh, Ernst Lubitsch. And the thing is, they always spoke about the, the Lubitsch touch, that it was so delicate, so European. And Mel's movies are balls to the walls, you know. Uh, and so he, the conceit of, of making that movie was that Mel didn't want to be... Uh, uh, credited as the director even though he was the director right. so the person who's who's uh credited is alan johnson the choreographer but mel was the director so uh, and mel was not just uh abusive to me he was abusive to most people in the, on that cast because he was nervous um and then of course he fell in love with me when i delivered the goods on that uh to be or not to be speech. That's, but, that speech is still, I, I, when I see that, it is a beautiful, beautiful piece of acting. Thank you. But you see, there's a good, that this is a perfect acting uh, uh, lesson. I was trying to do Shakespeare. I've never done Shakespeare. I was trying to be Shylock or whatever. And what happened was that the day that we shot it, first of all, I came up with a very good plan, which was I was going to do the speech 
as if I was uh, doing it for the Jews against Hitler, even though I did it for Mel, who was imitating Hitler. Right. But I was kicking ass for the Jews. That was a good step. So because all of good acting is active. What I didn't realize was that in the shot before, my character, Pinsky, I think his name was, he comes, he comes out of, a, of, of the men's room of the theater and rushes towards Mel, who is portraying Hitler. And I am grabbed by two guys who I've never seen, who are these two big Orange County guys, blonde guys, who are like SS guys. And they grab me by the arm and they hurt me. And I'm hurting. And I'm scared to death. <laughs> Uh, and and so all of a sudden it became not only just kicking ass for the Jews, but it was, you better do this right or you're going to die. So it really wasn't anything that I could have conceived of in a vacuum. It had to do with the action that uh, immerses the, the character and then he has to perform. Well, you did it beautifully. Thank you. And thus endeth part one of my interview with Lewis J. Stadlin. Um, always leave him wanting more. That's what we say. And hopefully uh, you will want plenty more of Lewis. Uh, so that'll be next week's show. In the meantime, before I go, I wanted to uh, mention a few things. We talked about, and I showed you a clip of the man who came to dinner Uh the Man Who Came to Dinner, written by George Kaufman and Moss Hart, was based upon all their theatrical friends, most particularly this man, Alexander Wolcott. Um, if you can get this book that I'm holding up, for those of you who cannot see the show, it's called Smart Alec, The Wit, World, and Life of Alexander Wolcott by Howard Teichman. Um Alexander Wolcott was a critic, columnist. Um, he was the host of the radio show, The Town Crier. And he was a very, very strange individual. But the Algonquin Roundtable was built all around Wolcott and his friends. Um, so when Hart and Kaufman were trying to think of a new play to do, they thought, why don't we do something about our friends. And then they thought, well, how do we do that? And they thought, Walcott. What if Walcott came to visit and stayed? And that was the concept for the man who came to dinner. Uh, obviously, they had other friends uh, who were put that Noel Coward had a uh, character based on him and of course banjo who lewis played based on my man harpo marks here this is harpo's autobiography harpo speaks uh if you can get a copy of harpo speaks take a look at it it's a really fun book uh and it's the first time you'll hear harpo marks talking about harpo marks in the meantime uh, thanks for being here for part one of my Lewis J. Stadlin interview. Please come back next week for two. And now I will give the usual commercial before I go, where I ask you to, A, subscribe to the show on my YouTube channel or your favorite podcasting network. If you would like to send happy messages to me and tell me how much you love the show, you can send it to me at according to Yoni at gmail.com and um, hopefully we'll have a, have a website soon uh, but uh, you can always find us on Facebook and Twitter and uh, just keep coming back and enjoy the show because if you enjoy this half as much as I'm enjoying it we're all having a great time anyway until next time take care of yourselves don't do anything silly Keep wearing a mask. Bye-bye.